Ladies and gentlemen, moving along with today's proceedings, we will now proceed our first session on Are Economic Populist Policies on the Rise? Examining the Malaysian Social Protection Framework. Please welcome on the stage our speakers, Dr. Juita Paman, Dr. Kamalu Farleto, Dato Wira Dato Rais, and also the moderator, Melissa. I'm very well aware that I'm the person standing between you and lunch, so I will make it worth, worth your while. While we um, kind of warm up to the session today, we're going to be, um, oh, very quickly let me introduce myself properly to those who I haven't met yet. My name is Melissa Idris. I am a senior editor and anchor with Astro Armani, where I host a couple of talk shows. One is called Consider This, which is a news talk show, weekdays at 10. And the other is um, the show called The Future's Female, Saturday, Sundays at 10. Um, and that's where I speak to really remarkable women doing making a difference in their respective fields. Okay, so um, let me very quickly introduce my guest. I'm going to start at the far end. Dr. Juita Mohamed, Director of Research director, um, and Director of Economics and Business at IDS Malaysia. Dr. Carmela Pulito, the Chief Executive of the Center for Market um, Education, and Dr. Weir, Dr. Wright is Hussein um, Arya, President and CEO of Amir Research. Okay, all right, so today's topic, uh, we're going to be discussing um, our economic populist policies on the rise. So essentially, we've got about an hour for this session, and I'm going to begin with opening statements from each of the speakers, each of the panelists. I'm happy to take questions throughout the session. We've got about 20 minutes of q and at the end, but more than happy to take questions throughout if you think of any. So go ahead, put up your, quest, uh, your hands, and then we can run the mic over to you. <clears throat> okay, so a little bit about this session. I think Trisha did a wonderful job of, um, hello Trisha, <laughs> did a wonderful job of setting the scene about why it's important to pay attention to um, economic policies, particularly if they are short-term and populist in nature, what that means for the country. Essentially, just ask, answering the question, are these policies working for the people? And what is the long-term impact? Right? So for the past year or so, the government has resorted in some populist measures. We've got um, this all in response to the rising cost of living. You know, we've had the special EPF withdrawals, we've had um, the banning of export of chickens. I mean, you've seen all of this in your periphery, I'm sure in the news headlines, but we want to get into a deeper understanding of whether these are knee-jerk reactions, whether they address the underlying problem, and whether we have an adequate social safety net and protection programs. So, quite a lot to cover in the next, in the next one hour. We also, um, as Ben Sufyan mentioned a bit earlier, on the road to GE15, who knows when that's going to be. It could be next month, it could be end of the year, it could be next quarter, who knows. But we're on the road to GE15. The question is whether we're going to be seeing more populist economic policies in the lead up to elections. The answer is probably yes, but okay, <laughs> I, will probably, I will ask my, my panelists. Now, um, let's, let's uh, start with kind of opening statements. I want to um, discuss, uh, I'll give each panelist a couple minutes to give their opening statements. And the, to set the scene, I will ask whether, you know, in the past couple of years, um, on the show that I host, hosted with my esteemed co-host tonight. <laughs> I think for the past couple of years we have probably used the, the phrase build back better dozens if not hundreds of times. The question is are we building back better? Have we um, or have we res uh, resorted to short termism in our policies because of the pandemic, because of the emergency, 
Um, let's begin there. If I may invite Dr. Jirita to start up your opening remarks, please. Thank you, Melissa. So, yeah, there's no way of answering this question in, or like in a one-liner. But we all know that this is truly a year for recovery for Malaysia and also for the region. Uh, we see that Malaysia's economy is on an upward track to recovery uh, from the pandemic, um, looking at successful vaccination um, drives and um, full withdrawal of movement restrictions. Um, and the World Bank has also projected that uh, the Malaysian economy is going to expand um, at about 5.5% this year. And this is again mainly due to strong rebound in consumption. We see that our um, labor market is improving, um, just looking at the unemployment rates. Um, but um, again, the World Bank has also um, highlighted that for us to further sustain our recovery, uh, we need to be looking at um, the economic impact of the pandemic um, by gradually, again, rebuilding fiscal buffers through increased um, revenue collection as well as allocating funds on uh, spending um, efficiently. So again, when we look at a couple of uh, policies introduced this year, I would say it's not all bad. Um, I'm just going to highlight two in particular, and I, I think my uh, fellow um, colleagues up here will also share their thoughts. Um, and again, in this year, we see that um, we have ratified and entered into force the RCEP agreement early this year in March, and this is something that is very good. Um, again, um, this is um, a good sign um, that um, we see that businesses um, can latch on this free trade agreement. As we all know, um, FTAs in general can lessen um, or um, lessen business costs through various trade facilitation measures to again support trade activities beyond our borders. And again, this is what is very much needed in the region especially in a post-pandemic context, looking at Malaysia as a small open economy. But nevertheless, there are other policies that are of concern, um, such as uh, the withdrawal of EPF earlier this year and the chicken export ban this year. Um, so looking at the final withdrawal um, introduced this year, um, again, the numbers are of concern. and. Ideas has released a press statement uh, in March stating that the withdrawal of up to 10,000 ringgit uh, for this uh, latest round um, risks leaving even more savers and contributors with insufficient savings once they reach retirement. And yesterday, EPF has also um, made a, a statement that for us to retire comfortably within the next 20 to 30 years, we will all need at least 1 million ringgit. Yeah, that was, I saw that, and then I also saw a comment that said, um, to live comfortably and to move to Alistair. So I think a lot of people will move to Alistair after this. So and, again, yeah. Yeah. and again, we don't know, again, this is just a projection. We don't know how fast inflation um, rates will rise in the next 20 years, and 1 million ringgit is indeed a big number, even in nominal terms. And looking at our wage policies, looking at our, yeah, many other policies, this is something that is um, very um, worrying indeed. Um, so I'll pass the floor to the other okay. colleagues. Well, we're definitely going to be talking about those um, special EPF withdrawals, and we can talk a little bit about it. And I'm sure everyone here has. Um, a, a, some skill in the game, so we can kind of talk a little bit about that. Uh, but I do want to hand it over to Carmela first. Um, are populist economic policies on the rise, Carmela, in your opinion? Yes, just let me to say first that if everybody moves to our star, the cost of living in our star will be cheaper to live in seven for them. <laughs> <laughs> but to, to come back to the, to the point, yes, I think that uh, um, over the past two years, we have seen uh, really not necessarily populistic measures, but policy was very much reactive. 
So what, uh, what has been lacking has been a sort of strategy, okay? So a long-term vision, uh, deciding what, what we want uh, for the country. And, and I think that uh, this regard, the COVID was only part of the picture, part of the story. Um, probably Malaysian political parties uh, are uh, reshaping their identities and therefore they are trying to look also at which kind uh, of perspective they want to offer for the future. Uh, then uh, with, with, with the pandemic, the issue of uh, showing that they were doing something for the people was uh, uh, probably exacerbated. And therefore, we have seen a lot of policies being implemented without the proper trade-off analysis. Thomas Sowell is used to say there are in policy making there are no solutions there are only trade-offs. So uh, it is important to recognize that when you do something, whatever you do in policy, this has always a cost. And uh, a proper analysis of how much a certain policy is going to cost uh, is uh, is too important to be disregarded. So today we are living in inflation because we have lockdown and because lockdown forced the government to implement other policies. We can't blame the war in Ukraine. Okay, this is something that the, the rising movement of price was there since the end of 2020. Um, and to, to conclude my thought, this is why recently in, in some interviews I advocated for elections as soon as possible, not because elections are a panacea in itself, but because elections would eventually force uh, the political groups uh, to show what they have in mind for the future of the country and therefore the Malaysian citizens could have the possibility to choose based hopefully on a clear and understandable platform. Uh, obviously we need uh, certain policies to put Malaysia back on track but we will never know uh, if uh, political groups are committed to that policies if they are not forced to say what we want for the future. So many things to unpack, but let's go to Raiz first. Raiz, um, what do you make of the economic policies that you've seen in the past, I'll say, couple of years? Are they um, more populist in nature, in your opinion? I think... Uh, okay. Yeah. I think... I think... I think uh, Malaysia has perfected the art of economic populist policies uh, over the years. I think it started in the 80s and uh, it goes uh, unabated, uh, mostly because of uh, responding, reacting to uh, the voter, the banks and voter. Uh, this is the situation that unfortunately has been here in Malaysia for a very, very long time. Having said that, um, one thing that we have to start thinking about is making sure going forward the policies must be uh, directed or, or, or guided by the input, output, outcome, impact model, which the Scandinavian countries and many other countries like Korea, I mean South Korea, uh, uses uh, effectively in allocating the scarce uh, budget, the scarce resources that they have to produce the optimum return. Now, we have so many problems uh, in Malaysia. Yes, the COVID was there. I'm, I'm glad that uh, Dr. Camelo talked about the Ukrainian situation, but it is not the reason why we are facing the inflation currently. It is because of so much of bad policies. And then you look at the way the government expenditure has been. If you just look at uh, the Auditor General report, uh, on the average, 2% of the GDP is gone through uh, leakages, uh, corruption. 4% uh, uh, Transparency International estimated uh, the same figure. Now, if you look at the average, that is about two-thirds of a trillion ringgit uh, that has happened that we have lost uh, through uh, these uh, policies that is very ad hoc in nature, very uh, motivated by, I'm going to win this constituency at the next election. So these are the problems. This is a basic problem. And if you look at the economic spillover of the loss of two-thirds of the trillion ringgit, it will touch about three trillion ringgit over the 25 years. Now, big numbers. So 
why and where we are here today is that because our political landscape is so uh, what we call uh, completely uh, out of the way and, and, and look at the way the things are happening now. And because of the GE15 is coming, uh, you will expect some uh, good year of, uh, budget, yes. But again, will this be good for our long term? Our debt is spiraling our control. It's about 88% of the GDP. It's about 1.3 trillion ringgit. This will have a far-reaching implication for us. Henceforth, I think the economic policies uh, must be dictated by data, science and economics, number one. Number two, let us go back to the IOOI model for every expenditure. I will, in uh, later stages, uh, relate uh, my own experience uh, managing a GLC for 15 months, and I will let you know exactly what we did and uh, what happened and uh, what is being uh, uh, undone now. So this is a very important thing. I think as recent as two days ago, this particular GLC has three officers arrested with 27 million ringgit worth of stuff. Why did you just name the GLC? <laughs> it's no secret. Right, it's used to um, uh, head, be the chairman of uh, MTEC. There we go. There we go. I'm just going to name it. I mean, we're all friends here, right? We can all Google who was arrested and what. Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, pull on some of the threads that you, you brought up. And I do want to bring up what Carmela said about hoping GE15 comes as soon as possible. I don't know whether everyone agrees with that, but coming as soon as possible so that we all know what the economic policies are for the parties, the coalitions, the candidates. We might get an idea of what um, what kind of trajectory they're, they're looking at. Is that necessarily the case? Um, and I'm going to ask you, right, because of your, your, your experience in politics, Will GE15 expose candidates and political parties' um, economic plans? And isn't that the basis of what populist policies are about? That they're going to um, create policies that will win voter support, that will win over um, what they think will win. So, I mean, isn't that just the basis of populism? Um, I will be brutally honest, as always. Uh, you see, uh, the, the way that 222 parliamentary constituency has been uh, configured, uh, a choreograph, it went through a massive uh, level of uh, gerrymandering. So it will always benefit one particular uh, political party, and no matter what policy that you do, uh, it will uh, well urban, semi urban, but then you have the rural uh, voters back. So having said that, uh, I am of the opinion that uh, who all political parties, save for one coalition maybe, uh, will focus on populism. Uh, that is not going to be anything uh, different from it. What it, They will try to appeal to these particular voter banks and to make sure that uh, they secure the power first. Now, uh, this has been all the time, right? Uh, obviously, uh, the government that took in 2018 came up with some other ideas and they wanted to have uh, anchored reforms and they came up with the 10 promises over the 100 days and 60 promises over the 5 years and they were on the trail trying to fulfill those particular uh, in fact in the first year anniversary of that government uh, then Prime Minister said we have delivered about 30% so uh, another 4 years to go then everybody knows what happened 22 months later. Now, having said that, uh, again, for this particular G15, uh, I do not think that you're going to see something uh, Harvard School of Thought uh, in economics policies. I think you're going to see the same old, same old goodies and sugar and this and that. It will start with the budget and uh, that will be accentuated. So I do not think you will see a, a, a massive departure. However, those uh, who are in the opposition coalition will probably come up with some ideas, some suggestions, how to recalibrate, revamp uh, this economy. Malaysia cannot continue with this trajectory of uh, populism uh, to, to just to cater for election time. 
Right. Okay. So coming back to to Carmelo, who said that you know there, um, you brought it up that you want to see what the economic policies are. My my question is, in a time of um, inflationary pressures, do you think inflation is um, a boon for populists? Because we know populists feed off the um, economic pain and suffering and discomfort of the people, they use that as populist ammunition. So do you think that given this period of inflation, this might be the ammunition used by populists? Absolutely, this is, uh, this is true. And um, an economist that comes from a very different background than mine, uh, Axel Legendfeld, that passed away a few months ago, stress uh, exactly this because in particular in period of high inflations there is the tendency first to find the culprit and uh, usually the, the proper culprit which is the government is never is never on trial and secondly there is the the search for the uh, for the man that can save the nation so the idea to uh, from the people to look for for a populist leader so this risk is, uh, is very true. And here I think we go back to an issue that was raised during the first, uh, the first discussion, uh, the issue of education. So this, uh, uh, this idea that, that the people, uh, the lay people look for a man that can save the nation, that can implement uh, policies with a, a saving appeal, with a messianic appeal, I would say, uh, becomes precisely because there is a very little understanding of what, for example, inflation is. And I think we at CME we have done for the past uh, one and a half year uh, uh, a good amount of work in trying to communicate uh, uh, where inflation uh, comes from. And uh, to, to, to make it short, in two years, 2020, 2021, uh, cumulatively the GDP in Malaysia went down 2.7% and the money supply grew 28%. This is inflation. Okay, um, Ju Juita, I might come to you in a bit, but I do want to stick on the topic of uh, inflation while you have the mic on you, um, Carmelo. The August uh, CPI print saw the sixth consecutive month of year on year increase. That's 7.7% on year on year, right? Clearly, the inflation gauge is steadily increasing. You, Carmelo, um, had written, if I'm not mistaken, you said that the monetary nature of inflation has not been recognized, that given the expansionary fiscal and monetary policies implemented to address uh, lockdowns and um, uh, the, the effects of COVID-19, there has been excess money supply. That means too much money in the system chasing too few goods. You mentioned a bit earlier, it's really not about the supply chains, it's not about Ukraine, it's not, it's not about that, that's transitory. What do you then um, hope people understand about the nature of inflation that we're facing now? Well, uh, I would like the, the people to understand that inflation is primarily a monetary phenomenon and persistent and generalized inflation comes always and uniquely from an excess of money supply, or more precisely, when the money supply grows at a faster pace than the GDP. Okay, so this is the, uh, the bottom line. And therefore, there is only one institution that can create inflation, and that institution is the government that borrows money, that prints money. Uh, and therefore, there is no easy way out of it. Uh, we, we cannot have a, a messiah saving us from inflation. We cannot have the OPR saving us from inflation simply. Uh, we need bold and brave policies uh, that include rationalization of government spending. And all these policies will have a cost. If we wanted to avoid this cost, we should have avoided to create inflation. You're telling me that the Federal Reserve cannot save us from inflation? That Fed Negara cannot save us from inflation, is that right? Well, from Paul was saying, and the Fed. <laughs> and so the Fed. <laughs> so the, while the, the monetary policy as a role in itself uh, is not sufficient, also because by the time that the effect of raising the OPR will manifest themselves, we will be in a totally uh, different economic uh, period, so it takes time. It's there's not a, an instant a time. Lag. It's a, a time, time lag, lag. Okay. and uh, 
uh, again, as the problem is an excess of money supply, the best way to, to, to recourse to that is to start cutting uh, government spending. I, I don't know how to react to that, but okay. <laughs> given, given this that. will have a contractionary effect, no doubt. Every kind of measure that aims at uh, curing inflation is contractionary. Okay. So that's why it is important for the government to convince the people that that kind of measures are necessary and are for the common good. So, and the populist government can do that. So Carmelo's diagnosis is that government needs to cut spending and budget is in two weeks' time, and it is an election budget. So imagine if um, Camilla told the Prime Minister you have to cut funding, what that would look like in the budget. I'm going to come back to you. And That's why I'm not a politician and I'm not an advisor of the government. <laughs> I'm so glad that you made that caveat. Um, Rais, I want to think about what spending cuts do to your, <laughs> to your agency, but um, I want to come to Juita and talk a little bit about the fact that inflationary pressures and why it's important that wages are, um, uh, go up or increase accordingly, but that's not what we're seeing in the economy today. So um, can, can we talk a little bit about the structural um, issues that suppress wages in Malaysia? Thank you, Melissa, for that very important question. Um, I do believe that, again, there's a trend of our wages being sticky wages, and this is um, uh, the it goes back to the um, sticky wage uh, theory. But looking at our trends for entry level workers, and this is very apparent during the pandemic as well, um, it has not changed for 20 years. And there is something structurally wrong with this because we are a developing economy. Hence, wages should increase to mirror inflationary pressures, however small or big it is, and also to mirror the increasing cost of living. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I read somewhere that entry level um, is 1,590. That is around that. Slightly about the minimum wage. About that. And um, again, it hasn't increased by more than 2,000 for the last 20 years. And we did see that during the pandemic, that this was still the trend. And there is, again, something structurally wrong with this, given that we're, again, an open economy and also a developing economy. So this is where our labor policies and the empowerment of trade associations is very much needed. Of course, the introduction of the minimum wage law is very much welcomed. But again, the setting of the minimum wage every two years needs to be backed by data. And as of today, we've had a few increases of 200 ringgit and 300 ringgit in nominal terms. But then we do not know how this is backed by um, data on the ground. Um, in other countries, obviously, you do have the minimum wage law, but you also have the empowerment of workers to negotiate and bargain not just wage packages, and, but also non-wage packages like um, their conditions at work and non-monetary compensations. So again, this is something Malaysia needs to think about, especially if we aspire to be a developed country a high income status country, because those are the characteristics that we need to have on the ground. Empowerment of labor, empowerment of workers on the ground, so that wages cannot stay low as they are right now. Jamita, is, it, is that component still missing from public discourse, policy discourse? Is it still missing or are there um, efforts to increase labor empowerment? I'm glad you mentioned that because then I can talk about CPTPP. Um, so we're on our road to ratifying um, the CPTPP agreement. Um, hopefully by the end of this year, we have um, presented different bills. Uh, the government has, has presented different bills on this and there are two outstanding bills um, 
for ratifying the CPTPP, and this goes back to one um, one um, provision on labor, which is to to give the power um, for negotiation and bargaining um, bargaining and negotiating rights um, of the workers in Malaysia. So this is something that is happening. Okay. Um, but whether it I, I don't know when this will happen, but again, the CPTPP again does include the commitments of reforms that are not necessarily just for um, traditional um, traditional trade chapters, but also non-traditional trade chapters like labor, SOE, government procurement, and also environment. So this is something that I feel is a very positive note that if Malaysia does ratify, then it's a big signal that in terms of trade, we would be quite liberal. Okay, all right, which is very nicely fitting with the conference. Thank you for that, Chita. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna get you to, to hold out your mic again because I do want to tie in stagnant wages with the special EPF withdrawals and um, retirement fund sufficiency. So when the government, if you cast your mind back to when the government was talking about um, special EPF withdrawals, do you remember at the beginning of the year, there was that 10,000 ringgit special withdrawal? And there was a lot of discussion about, it was, it was really kind of putting in a few directions. One was, hey, it's our money, we're struggling, give us access. And the other part was, were policymakers saying, well, if you take it out now, you're not going to have enough to retire, which was reiterated by EPF, telling everyone to go to other start to retire. But, um, <laughs> the with the EPF withdrawal, can you understand the where the differences of conversation were coming from. Those two narratives about, we need access to our money, we are struggling, we don't make enough as it is, and the economy was uh, just about to recover post lockdown, versus thinking about retirement sufficiency, which for many workers are years away. Well, I don't think I need to answer that question. I think the data can answer that question. So again, this, are the numbers that are published even before the final withdrawal. So, um, so as highlighted by EPF, um, when um, the previous, like second to the last one, uh, EPF withdrawal programs um, were introduced, about 6.1 million members had had less than 10,000 savings in their retirement funds. Um, but when we look at the October 2021 numbers, 3.6 million contributors had less than 1,000 ringgit in their accounts. And this is again the second last withdrawal. And from this group of 3.6 million contributors, 2 million Bumibutra members have less than 1,000 ringgit in their savings. So the data speaks for itself. Where do we go from here, given our current economic turmoil, um, our policies on labor and wages are still not that strong? Where does it leave our population, which is, again, going to enter its aging society right. definition within the next decade, um, according to the UN. So it goes back to how do we, like how do we envision our social protection plan to be and where we are in terms of building that for our population in the next decade to come. Right, is those numbers that Jonita just mentioned, do you see the fact that so many people felt the need to dip into their retirement savings? Was that a failure of government economic policy and the social safety net? That without government's um, help in supporting people, citizens had to dip into their own retirement savings? Um, failure I, of government? I, I think uh, at that point of time, during the first MCO and subsequent, subsequent MCO, 
uh, Emil Research released a survive to restart package. Uh, certain things that we need to do uh, in the meantime that we are weathering through this uh, MCO because basically during MCO people lose their jobs, their, their, their living is tough and uh, I personally have seen many people uh, suffering during the time. In fact, uh, a family actually visited me telling me that uh, they're going to commit suicide because they have uh, run out of all the uh, avenues uh, and their restaurant has to be shut down and uh, the, the landlord asked them to leave and uh, it was quite bad. Now, asking the people to go back to their own savings is not a policy that I would have uh, uh, adopted. I think uh, EPF was right that we need to have a reasonable level of uh, savings for our old age. Now having said that, there can be also uh, a lot of uh, cash transfers and other methodologies that can be used to help people in need. It's not across the board. Eh? At that point of time, the money was given across the board. 1.3 million civil servant was also given, whereas their salaries and everything was being uh, secured. So I think the policy was not dynamic enough, flexible enough to cater for all. I think that is uh, something that we need to uh, address and a lot of money has been wasted. Then there's also, uh, he talked about the rationalization of government expenditure. I think on a per capita basis, Malaysia has the highest number of cabinet ministers. And I think maybe we can start there. Then we have agencies. One, multiple agencies are doing the same thing. You have MDAG, you have Technology Park Malaysia, you have four or five different agencies. Don't go too far away. Let's go and see down south in Singapore. In Singapore, they only have one agency to drive the digital economy. In Malaysia, God knows how many. The last town I had was six or seven. And every one of them has a CEO. Every uh, CEO has a driver. And every, driver, every CEO office has about 10, 15 people. So it is unproductive resources being use. Then, I've always advocated this as well. When you take loans, government can take loans. I, I differ a little bit from our brother here uh, with regards to government expenditure. I think government expenditure is important. But what type of expenditure? Do you start buying Hermes bag and diamond out of the loans? So we need to be very careful, right? We need to be very careful. You take loan and that uh, government loan uh, it should be productively used, productively employed to have a good yield. And that yield will then go back to, that's how economic growth is all about. But if you take uh, this and then you uh, create a project called DNB, uh, you know DNB? Uh -huh. So they say DNB, they're going to bring 5G to rural area. Now the problem is, do you need 5G in rural area? <laughs> Let's ask this question rationally. In rural area, they I'm one of the person who have advocated rationalization of telecom sector. Now, 5G, we are going to spend billions. We could have easily gone through the uh, multiple wholesale network, but we chose the single wholesale network. Multiple wholesale network is where the competition is going to be. And then the company will raise funds to build the network. However, in this case, we, the people, the taxpayers, including you, boss, are going to pay for it. And why? They say, no, this is not, we have to raise to go. Fine, you raise to go. Who gives the underwriting? The government, uh, the MOF Inc. gives the undertaking. When you fail to uh, fulfill the payment, what happens? We have to pay. Food security is another issue. Inflation. Right? right? In inflationary pressure. Mm -hmm. Why do you think uh, uh, today food is becoming so, I mean, my wife was telling me that every time she goes to Jaya Grocer and come back, and the, 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 the number of goods getting smaller and smaller in the, in the cup. Why? And the price is going up 20%, 30%. You talk about this inflation that uh, Melissa quoted just now. I think that's severely massaged. For me, the inflation that we are seeing in Malaysia is highest ever that you can ever see. Food. And then you have this finance minister who says that depreciation of currency is good for us because of export. He, doesn't, he cannot remember then the input cost for production, manufacturing. Somebody talked about chicken, right? When we talk about chicken, 
They always said that we need to do a ceiling price. I said that is the one of the most nonsensical policies that you can ever introduce. Why? Because in order to done the chicken feed, 70% increase in the price. And we import almost all the data. Right? Uh, I'm not uh, talking about data in the context of yeah, political <laughs> data. And, 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 and the, uh, the freight charges, the shipping charges, increased by f uh, four times. Okay. So this inventory pressure then cascaded to the people. And again, you want to give this EPA withdrawal, this, that. It is not addressing the problem. That is why New Zealand came up with a very good uh, societal well-being policies. And there, they use the IOI model again. So, in a, yeah, okay, I will talk about that a little bit later, but IOI model must be the crux of all government expenditure and all government budget. If you don't do that, if you do not know the eventual impact, whereas you happily spend the money, then you can get DNP. Okay, I would like Carmela to respond to that, but um, I do want to open the floor to questions first. Does anyone have any questions for our panelists? We've got one over there. We've got um, Andrew. Andrew? Yes, it is Andrew, my eyes. Um, two and three. So can we run some mics over? Let's take two first. Let's take on this half. I'm going to segregate this room. Uh, let's take from this half. We've got a gentleman in the back, and we've got Andrew Ku. Um, can we give a mic to... Oh, okay, never mind. While they're, while they're running the mics, um, hold on to your questions. Um, I do want to ask uh, Carmelo very quickly about the handling of the poultry uh, <laughs> industry with the ceiling prices and the export ban. I personally was grateful for my KFC during the very difficult time of NCO. I was grateful that you know, um, chicken prices remained at 9 ringgit 20 cents, but I'm mistaken. And I got to have my drumstick. But Carmela, you are quite, um, you said that the the government mishandled that. Could we, could you delve a little bit into why you think um, the ceiling prices, or even the floating ceiling prices may not work? Well, it is, uh, sorry, it is quite simple. Uh, basically, uh, during the during lockdown, uh, both demand and supply was suppressed. Okay, uh, for demand, usually this kind of adjustment are faster. We cannot go out to eat, and so we don't eat or we we consume less. For supply, the adjustment is much more radical. Means to shut down plants, uh, to fire workers, uh, to close down farms, businesses that uh, go out of the market, etc. The moment in which the economy reopened. Uh, we all go uh, out again to eat, we are, we are eager to go out and we start to eat again chicken. And this adjustment is quite fast. But for the supply side, to, to match that adjustment is, much, is, a, is a much more slower uh, process. You need to reopen a farm, the farms that close down for good will not reopen. Uh, you, uh, you need to, to hire workers that you cannot find uh, because of the legislation introduced during the lockdown. And therefore, this uh, tension between supply and demand uh, create uh, uh, price, price tensions. Together with the increase of the input, you know, feed represents 75% of the running cost of a chicken farm, and Malaysia doesn't produce feed at all, uh, the skyrocketing uh, sea freight, and etc. Now, the only way that you have to, to get supply and demand back on track is to allow supply to step up. And in order for supply to step up, supply needs to have the incentive. So you need to allow that temporary period of high prices in order for supply to step up and then prices to eventually cool down again. If you don't allow that and you introduce price ceiling, you are basically prolonging the agony. And when you remove price ceiling, the tension will be there Again, right. so you have not solved the problem, you have put it under the carpet. But what you didn't mention was that temporary period of high prices means a lot of pain for a lot of people, like KFC particularly. But um, yeah, so that's, that's a trade-off that you were talking about. No solutions, just trade-offs. And we can delve a little bit deeper into that, but I do want to give room for questions.